Hey everybody, hope you're all doing well. My name is Steven and this is the Storytime channel. Today we have some malicious compliance stories and our first story of the day is by Boogalugalugaloo. Never do more for a company than what they ask. For the past few years, I worked as a certified welder. ASME 3G certified, specializing in stainless steel. Well, this company I worked for had absolutely abysmal starting pay at $17 an hour. For a welder, that's trash, but they sell it based on the work environment and culture. Anyway, they said I could expect substantial raises if I proved myself. I had made it to $19 in two years by being the squeaky wheel, as the regular raises were a lie. That was still quite poor, considering their competitor starts at $21. So raise time was coming. I figured I'd absolutely kill it to earn my worth. For the job I was doing, the allotted time that we had to meet was approximately 12 to 16 hours, depending on the job. But the company-wide average for the past several years was 20, two full workdays. My coworker averaged 24 hours and made the same pay as me. My average was 10. That's one completed job a day. But when I kicked it up, I was capable of anywhere from four to six hours depending on the job's details. I literally could complete two full jobs in a single day when they gave me two days to do that job. So in the time allotted for one job, I was completing four to a better standard than was expected, I might add. Anyways, I bust my back doing this for a solid six months. Then come review time, I plead my case. I pointed out that the shop rate charged on these jobs was $70 an hour, and that being on average six hours or under, give or take, I saved the company $420 a job, or roughly $800 a day. When compared to my coworker, I saved them over $1,200 on any given job. I thought I had my case nailed, but the plant manager looked me in the eye and said, You don't save the company a darn thing. And I didn't get a raise. Not even a few cents. So I decided it was time to quit breaking my back exceeding what was expected of me, and I cut back my production. I still couldn't pull off what they allotted me. It felt like intentionally wasting time to do a job in 12 hours or more. So I dropped back to one a day, still exceeding their expectation and still doubling the output of my coworker. Well, the job started to pile up. The laser was still burning two or sometimes three jobs a day for our team of two welders. A month of this and I got a meeting with HR and the plant manager for my bad attitude and intentional wasting of company time and money. They said I was entitled by thinking I was worth more than they paid, that I was arrogant for expecting more. Honestly, the audacity of this blew me away. If my work didn't save them a dime, then how does my cutting back to what's expected cost them anything? I stuck with that for a few months before they let me go while I was out on leave for the disease who shall not be named, collecting a few weeks PTO. I got a call from HR. The first thing they said to me was, we accept your resignation. I tried to argue it, but they wouldn't budge. To heck with that company. My friend who still works there says production has never been the same since I left. Ha. Huh. I'm going to go out on a limb and assume working for the competitor just wasn't a realistic option in the sense that maybe the competitor was an hour away from where OP lived and the commute just wasn't realistic compared to what they were making with the current company. That said, OP did have inherent plus value, and I bet they're going to be suffering now that they lost OP. If you felt like you were being treated unfairly and being paid under the rate what you should be paid, but the next opportunity for work was probably an hour plus away, would it still be worthwhile in your opinion to go and check out applying to that competitor? Let me know in the comments down below. Our next story is by Tales from Tech Support. STDs are cheaper than PhDs. I work for a company that, among other things, does security testing and verification of hardware that has strict security requirements. Think payment terminals or chips and credit cards or set-top boxes. Given this is a niche market and requires a lot of expertise, expensive equipment, and knowledge, our rates are high. The day rate for me could buy you an entire weekend with a high-class escort as the client in this story once told me. But we have a stellar reputation in the industry to go above and beyond for clients and are still cheaper than your product shipping, late or never. Most customers understand this. Large and established clients know the costs and don't ever mention it to me. I have to check with the account manager to see how much he sold me for this time around. 
but we also serve smaller clients, startups or smaller companies that move into manufacturing or designing custom components or products that require our services as well. The company in question was a small company in Korea that made most of their money with a few legacy components used in alarm systems among others. They had a monopoly on these components because larger manufacturers had since moved on because for them, the economics did not make sense anymore. This smaller company had made it work for a few years longer but already saw the end coming and started working on a new version of the component. Problem was that most of their capable staff had since left and the product they had been designing for the past year was in itself an achievement for how broken and insecure it was. But the owner of the company, who was the grand architect of this masterpiece, did not see it that way. This product was great and would pass all certifications and allow his company to rake in cash for another 20 years. I didn't know any of this going in. The account manager sold me on a run-of-the-mill job. Upon first day of review of the product, I found so many simple issues that I stopped the review and sat down with the client and the account manager to talk about changing the assignment to better serve their needs and make them actually pass certification on the first try. This often happens with smaller clients that don't always know the process to certification and find themselves lost in the process and the strict requirements. We generally take a more practical approach to help them out. As their end goal is certification, it makes sense to focus on solving the issues instead of spending two weeks on a report stating they have issues. While at first he was open to it, and we changed two weeks of testing and reporting to me helping them getting things sorted. That way they might be able to hit their deadline with a more secure, albeit lower rated, component. But he quickly invited himself into every conversation I had with an engineer, as he was the grand architect, and belittled me continuously, mostly ending with sexist remarks. I've learned to ignore the occasion comment by men in my field now, sometimes being witty and fast enough to sling a hurtful comment back to them. But the grand architect of sexism actually started getting under my skin by how often he did in just one 20 minute conversation. Surely continuously being sexist must even wear him out, right? Halfway during the week, he suddenly brought in a potential new customer while I was working, not having mentioned it to me. I think because the company I work for is well known in the industry, he tried to put me on the spot with the customer to tell him how secure the product is, thinking the situation would make me just say the product was great to not create an incident. I said to come back later because I am doing very time sensitive testing and they luckily never came back. If he had pushed it, I would have probably said something to the effect of, secure? Not at all. That's why I'm here. I cannot lie about findings. It's my reputation and consequences be darned. At the end of the week, we had an update meeting and Mr. Sexist only now told me that he changed his mind. He wanted nothing changed to the product anymore, me gone, and a report on his desk by next week he can share with the certification body. He was able to get an earlier slot for review and was going to use it. The product was fine and he was done with me. After a short argument with me staying professional and trying to tell him he was only going to pass at barely medium level with the fixes we put in over the last week, he told me that would be fine enough and to shut my mouth. I was a witch who talked too much and knew nothing of this field he was already in for 40 years. During the conversation, saying that the escort he slept with two weekends ago was cheaper than my day rate and she actually satisfied him. I had heard this one before, so without thinking, told him something to the effect of, STDs are cheaper than PhDs. He lost it and told me I was to write the required report for certification on the current product and nothing else. He did not want to see me at the office anymore. I said, sure, I will send you an official request to provide me the documents. Be sure to upload them as soon as you can so I can get on with it and you'll get the report in the mail before the end of day Friday next week. Unbeknownst to him, the fixes I put in over the week only existed in files on the local notebooks of the engineers. Most companies have proper version tracking or syncing software and workplace rules in place to handle this, but this company didn't, and only one engineer had the changes to the main design documents during the week. So the official documents that got sent to my company that evening were the files from before I had added fixes with the engineers, with only two minor fixes that made it in. 
but were insignificant in the slew of issues in this product. Normally, I would double check with the client and inform them about missing documents and the like, but he had clearly said in the email that these were the correct files. Sure, if you say so, enter my malicious compliance. I wrote the report based on the current documentation, but every item on the checklist would color red with a big fat fail in the results column. He got his report on Friday and within the hour was on the line with my account manager, who I had told everything. He had his own issues with the client and he was on board with me because he knew me for years and I had a stellar record with dozens of his other clients. And he basically told him that his attitude caused review problems and he himself had insisted these were the correct files he wanted reviewed. In the weeks after, there were some threats about a lawsuit, but with us backing out on helping them further, given non-payment and the threat of lawsuits, his company never put out the product and two months later was bought for cheap by one of our other clients and part of a talent acquisition. The employees were fine engineers, they just did not have the particular skill set they needed for this component. The client who bought them paid our outstanding bills without any issue. After making use of our connections there, got them to sell us the rights and design documents for this particular component in exchange for a week of training. It had no value to them, and given the costs of our training, it was a bargain as far as they were concerned. As broken as the product was, it was too good to pass up for training purposes because of the myriad of basic mistakes in it. I had already written half the training material in the report for it anyway. I still give training from time to time with it, detailing all the wrong ways of doing things. Not only did they completely shoot themselves in the foot, allow you to totally lead to their demise, but in the end, they turned into a textbook training material on what not to do. As far as outcomes of most malicious compliances, this is on the top end. And our final story of the day is by Tuna Tofu, Super Duper Dryer Fire. I rented a basement apartment long ago and, as I was taught growing up, went to empty the lint after I finished doing my laundry in the laundry room I shared with the landlord family upstairs. I had the darndest time getting the lint trap out. I finally get it out and the entire space is jam-packed with lint. I cleaned it all out and put the trap back. The dryer now took half the time to dry as it had before. So a couple of weeks later, I'm finishing up and emptying the trap and the landlady comes in and is horrified that I took the filter out. This dryer is pretty new and that filter keeps the lint from getting in the motor and destroying the machine. Half right. Never take that out again. Okay. After that, I left it to build up. Not my electricity when it took forever to dry. Not my house in danger of burning down. So I moved out shortly after that. There was a lot of general stupidity from the family upstairs that I couldn't put up with after the second month, but only moved a few streets over. Months later, on a cold and rainy fall afternoon, huge surprise. Sirens and fire trucks and flashing lights racing down the street to their house. Their dryer caught fire. I'm pretty sure the landlady blames me though for breaking her dryer instead of the tons of lint she let build up inside and eventually catch fire. But I did as told and never took the lint filter out again. I think despite how easy it is to just maliciously comply in the situation and feel like, well, their own downbringing will be because of their actions and their actions alone. When it's something where their stupidity alone can cause a fire and not only have the potential to damage their property but cause loss of life, not only to them but fire can spread very easily, I think it is a good idea to swallow your pride and explain that hey, you're supposed to empty the lint trap. I think at the very minimum if you tried to explain it and they refused to believe you and outright denied it, then it's a little bit more acceptable. I just don't know myself if I could morally sit around knowing that you're just basically waiting for the fire to start. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. So if you have a favorite story of the day, let me know which story and why in the comments down below. But besides that, if you enjoyed the video, please consider giving it a like. And if you haven't, subscribe and turn notifications on so you'll never miss an upcoming video. No matter what you do, whether it's just viewing the video, liking, subscribing, turning notifications on, I appreciate the heck out of it. Every little thing that you do helps the channel grow that much more and I can't thank you enough for it. So until next time, I hope you all have a wonderful day and I'll be right here next time on the Storytime channel.